Whatever it is has been kind of exorcised and learned she's going to go off and have a nice placid life somewhere. <laughs> Doing it as a man the local public radio. Or, or whether she's going to go wreak havoc from now on just in some different neck of the woods. Uh, I think uh, either is possible, you know, she's got so much capacity for. You know, I, don't, I don't think she would ever uh, uh, lie down and um, roll over, but you know, she might be um, working in a library somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, or, or perhaps in a lab. Yeah. 
I'm never going to go to the library again and look at the library in the same way. Uh, one more question that I have, and then I'm leaving it to the fans, is um, do you own any goldfish? <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I don't, I don't restrict it just to goldfish. I eat all kinds of fish, but I do prefer it raw. <laughs> Not more important people. All right, we've got fans over here. We've got fans to the right. I'm going to... It's funny you should ask that, Mark, because I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> um, and this, is the, this is the honest truth. And, and I mean, I know that... I mean, some of you may have theories again about what she said. Uh, but the reality is, the way television is filmed, you know, you, uh, even though it's very quick and you often have one take each time, particularly on a show like Wentworth, where we are just churning that out as quickly as we can, trying to do the best job we can. And if, if it, generally speaking, if it's technically good, they move on to the next shot. Um, so there's not a lot of indulgence, but even so, a, a scene will be shot from lots of different angles. You do what they call a master, where the, captures all the action and then we'll start come in and we'll do singles or a two shot and then a couple of little close up uh, uh, of elements if they've got time. Which means that I shot that scene, or, or, or I repeated that scene, you know, a number of times and each time I said something different in your Lynette. So the God's truth is I don't know actually what it was that I said. But there were different things every time, and the objective was always to rattle Vera's mother uh, out of her, you know, state that she was in, of sort of evil old cowness <laughs> against my dear friend Vera Bennett. <laughs> so it was a variety of things. I, I don't know, I couldn't begin to tell you what it was. There were a whole range of things that, that I did say. We can, Great question. Fantastic. All right, we're going back over to this side. Generally speaking, the better the writers, the less they write in of that stuff. But I would say the seeds were all that. They written into the first scripts that I read that she, I think, was uh, a bit of a germaphobe and that she was um, had elements of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I could tell from well, the way they'd written it, in fact, she was such a kind of protective and masked person, wanting to maintain an air of authority and mystery, that um, there would be a lot of repression, a lot of tension, and out of that, little things erupted, and little things like those specific gestures were just a response to, you know, reading a script and thinking, wow, what does that feel like? And before you know it, I have to say, and I've just been in a little round table with a few people were talking about that, I himself have just a little element of some of those things. <laughs> Harris McKenna Smith, who's a wonderful props master on the show, he, he, there would be such detail in all our settings. And then in my desk when I was the governor, um, Joan was always the governor. So. <laughs> <laughs> when, when she was the governor, I mean, my, my drawers were full of all sorts of interesting objects. So I could open the drawer and go, oh, I think I'll play with that today. You know, so, uh, and, but also in there were kind of microfiber cloth, dusting cloths and things like that. And I, myself, between takes, would always get my Five o'clock, I'll clean the desk off. <laughs> Before you know it, that sort of gets incorporated in the story too. Um, I thought I'll just take a couple of souvenirs to um, um, to remind myself of this extraordinary experience. And one of them was a bottle of Joan Ferguson's hand sanitizer, <laughs> which I put in the cupboard. Oh, I can open the cupboard, look at that, and have some fond memories. And then when COVID hit, I went, thank Christ for that, I've got hand sanitizer. <laughs> Open the cupboard and it was three years out of date. <laughs> so now, did you think that you were done for the show when they put you in the rounds? I, I'd assume that was the end of, of Joan, yes. I think we all did. So what happened? How did you find out that you were returning? Well, I have to say that Marcia Gardner, who was our script, the head of the script department, was always adamant that she didn't feel Joan Ferguson's story was over, but, you know, that you take that with a grain of salt. And, uh, and uh, so I just presumed that was it. But when I did get a phone call somewhere around the, well, the whole series, I'm sure you all know this because, you know, you're here because you're here and you're, you're, you have an investment in this, this series to some extent. And uh, the, at the end of season seven, the word was the series was coming to a close. 
and then there was such an outcry from, I don't know who, <laughs> that, uh, that they uh, decided that they gave the go-ahead for another 20 episodes. Uh, and that's when I got a phone call saying, how would you feel about coming out of the box? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that how they actually said it? Did they actually say, how did you feel about, how would you feel about coming out of the box? Somebody did, somewhere along there. That's and, fantastic. Uh, and uh, I, we had lots of conversations about how to make that uh, uh, credible uh, for the audience, but also for me, because I knew I would have to, you know, that might have been, that's a tricky ask. Particularly in a series, it's not meant to be utterly, totally kind of fantasy or sci-fi or, you know, it, you have to ground it. I think one of the great strengths of went with is that they, the stories are grounded in real life and death stakes and and true kind of pain and joy and struggle. And I wanted to make sure it was something I could sort of inhabit and believe in, you know, was just jumping the shark, as they say. So um, there were a lot of conversations around that, and um, although I knew it was going to be bloody challenging, it looked like it was going to be interesting. So I, yeah, I said, well, okay, well, I'll come out of that box. <laughs> I'm glad you can check the box on being buried alive. <laughs> you know, my, my great dream was to be able to, have we talked about this, is that um, I wanted to come out of the box with white hair. <laughs> <laughs> that she had gone through such a traumatic shock. <laughs> and it didn't quite work, but we ended up with a kind of compromise and I ended up with that kind of sort of silver yeah. ghost-like thing. It was perfect. Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. All right, we're coming right back. Everything. I do love classical music. I love classical music. In fact, in some of the early scripts, um, there would be music script to be written with the script to be playing against a particular scene. And sometimes I would say, oh, well, there's a specific one actually. I don't know if you remember, that there was a sequence where uh, Joan had to go to the dentist. <laughs> and then Juicy Lucy had to go to the dentist. <laughs> And in, the, and in the scripts, uh, these episodes started with Joan being at the dentist and supposedly some kind of, you know, I don't know what it was, hip hop, something was playing on the, uh, some, some local kind of, you know, Top of Pops kind of thing was playing on the radio, or a bit of headbanger or something, can't what it was. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I think that was meant to be repeated when, well, maybe it wasn't even in the script for when uh, Juicy Lucy came to visit and Joan was in there offering her dental services, and um, <laughs> uh, I said, wouldn't it be great though if, if, if it was actually uh, a, classical, a classical piece, something of sublime beauty, preferably women singing, and, uh, and that, I mean that's not me coming from out of the blue, earlier episodes and earlier seasons, it, you know, Joan listened to classical music and she fenced to classical music, so it had already established as a kind of trope within the series. But um, yes, classical music was very important to her, and actually I think that then gave birth to other sequences which had classical music. Um, classical music is important to me too, but I do, I do kind of love everything. I'm a, I'm a, um, uh, you know, everything. Hip hop, dub, whatever. And I also I love a lot of, um, I love, love, love of early jazz too. Oh, I think they're in with that one. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had been trained in stage fencing, which has got nothing to do with legitimate, you know, competitive fencing. So I had to be trained in competitive fencing. And I think there was a scene that had to be shot before I'd finished my crash climber course. And so there's a one wide shot where they got the Victorian, as in the state of Victoria in Australia, junior fencing champion to stand in for me for a wide shot on just in a kind of approach in the very first episode of season two, where John Ferguson's character was introduced. And it's a guy, and he's... <laughs> <laughs> His tits look nothing like mine. <laughs> And his hips were the size of an eight-year-old. <laughs> oh, that's going to pass for me. I have not done it. And from then on, they put me in. So I'm just going to do all this. I know you're all going to rewatch that episode now. They're all going to go, oh, yeah. Okay, you definitely can spot it. <laughs> all right, we're coming over to you. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so ask, me the, ask me the question again, please, Gary. I want to hear your voice again. What was your favorite scene? What was my favorite scene? What was your favorite scene? Oh, no, I don't have to be in it. What was your favorite scene? My, probably my favorite scene, I wasn't in either. What, Hard question, it is, you see, you've asked it to me. <laughs> <laughs> now you see how I am. Um, I would say the favorite scene that I wasn't in was probably the, oh God, there were so many. But I, when I watched the first season before I even knew I was in going to, well, maybe I did know I was going to be in it. <laughs> I'm just trying to think whether I'd gone to Was this when you had amnesia? Is this what I had? My name is Ken Maxwell. <laughs> the, um, I, I remember, anyway, I remember watching the very first season and there was a beautiful scene between uh, Celia Ireland and Sharina Clanton where Doreen and, um, what's her name? Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, even John Ferguson got it. The, uh, oh, Kath Maxwell, the, there was a scene just where the two of them kind of sat just side by side, comforting each other, where I thought, oh, this is so beautiful about, about uh, extraordinary circumstances in that prison where people, how hard it is to find a connection and a sense of family. So that was quite important to me, and I thought, this is a special series. The, my favorite scene that I did, that I was involved in, would be a whole, there actually are so many. What, I, I often go back to the very first scene that I shot with Kate Atkinson when John Ferguson asked Vera Bennett to her office for a drink. Um, partly because it was the first kind of, I'd done a few little bits and pieces and felt quite self-conscious and whatever. And then suddenly, at the end of the day, they were thinking they might have to drop the scene, but it was quite an important scene. And we went, oh no, 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 please let's do it. Cross shoot it, which everyone hates doing because the lighting has to be dull, but actors love it because you can really respond. Cross shooting is where they put two cameras over the actor's shoulders and they can shoot you just responding to each other rather than uh, doing individual singles where somebody's off camera and then, you know, and then cutting it all together. This way, in a way, the actors can kind of control what happens. And it was the first real season scene that Kate Atkinson and I did and it was such a joy to go, oh, wow, I love playing with you. <laughs> and, and that kind of led to a whole, and she's now a very dear friend and eight years later, you know, Vera and John have been through so much together, but that was quite special. And then there were other scenes that I loved. I loved punching everybody up in the yard. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! Who's next? That was great because I mean, at the time I would have been, I don't know, how long I'm just about to turn 64. But I would have been, I would have been about, I don't know, how many years ago? Maybe 58, 59. I thought, how many times has somebody, you know, irregardless of male, female, or otherwise, ask you at that age to get out there and just beat the shit out of people. <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> sorry, darling, I didn't say it. Sorry for the bad thing. <laughs> Psychological horror, yeah. rather than I'm not so great with the chainsaws and things. Yeah. Um, but I love, to be honest, my absolute favorite horror film is still probably The Haunting. Yeah. Woo! 1963 or whatever it was. Have you seen Julie Harris, Claire Bloom? Uh, extraordinary film. I uh, don't think there's even a drop of blood, but if that's particular, if anybody's seen it, you will you'll be a little nervous about. It's black and white, but sort of, 
you know, I don't know, looking at wallpaper kind of ever again. And, and, those, and doors that breathe and things like that. It's just the kind of um, psychological space of that kind of horror. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so that. No Hello, no. Megan. Welcome to the world of Whitmouth yeah, Thank you. Um, uh, just, for, just, just a, a kind of you know, to whatever I say, to give a kind of disclaimer to whatever, there was no such thing as a favorite blooper because when you make a blooper, you're fucking up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so frustrating because you're trying to do the best and probably the one that really frustrated me the most was when um, there was a particular point when Joan was still governor where she was meant to be getting quite frustrated with the behavior of people around her who should be behaving better. And she picked up her pencils and threw them against the glass window. And I, you know, as before the cameras are rolling, I went, oh, well, like this, and oh, perfect. It was just perfect. It was this huge spray of, you know, 50 pencils that all went, you know, in a beautiful starburst thing, you know, just on the, on the side of the glass with the camera. Could I repeat it? No. <laughs> we did, like, something when the cameras were rolling, I had to, like 25 takes, and that it turned into a kind of sequence on a blooper reel, and me just going, oh. <laughs> and it's just time to hand in your equity card. <laughs> that was the most frustrating, yes. Oh, some of my favorite ones that, you, you, in some jobs that I've done, particularly when you're doing a feature film, there's a little bit more time sometimes to work up elaborate pranks that you know are going to end up on a kind of blooper reel at the end just for the entertainment of your in-house cast and crew. Um, we didn't have a lot of time for this, but somewhere early on, Harris McKenna Smith, who I mentioned earlier, who was the props master, who's a huge Star Wars tragic, and has in his props van also all this Star Wars gear. He had you know, the, you know the, the lightsaber and a whole bunch of other things as well. And there was one day when Kate and I got dressed up as, you know, stormtroopers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Was there <laughs> All right, we're going to go over right on the side. Uh, I knew Maggie, I mean, I know Maggie, and have worked with Maggie on stage a number of times. Um, is, do you want to get that? <laughs> One speaker, please, so we can hear. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, to answer that question, no, I didn't speak to Maggie. Although I did phone her up and just say, "How are you feeling about this?" And this, you know, and because I kind of, I just, you know, she's a friend, and um, uh, she was, she was, is, and continues to be incredibly supportive, both of um, me and the series. That's great. She's a wonderful woman. Um, in terms of prepping for the one, the only thing I would say is that, uh, I'm giving too much, you say the character is so different from me. Unfortunately, she's not as different from me as one would hope. Uh, Remind me not to go back I, into the crater again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and if you see me in the street, just cross over the other side. Because you never know what I might do. Um, no, but all I mean, all I mean is that, uh, uh, once you know kind of what, what, what your job is for the day, you're, you're focused on that and it's sort of other little things that I would do that are part of a kind of an, a, a, a natural thing with every job that I would do is that I um, always like to have just a little spot where I can sit, you know, and see and I, I, I you know, it's, it's just instinctive now where you sort of find a place to put all your junk, it just, it's your place. <laughs> Just to create a carve out a little place to just be still. Um, for a long time, Candy Crush was part of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan does tell that story about how she thought that you know they were all a bit scared of me. I have to say, when I first arrived, <laughs> even though I did say on my very first day in rehearsal when I first arrived, I said I just you know I, I knew some of them from having worked with them or knew them from socially being actors together, some who I've just seen, but um, I introduced myself and, and apologized right off the get-go to say, I want to apologize for what my character may and probably will do to more than the of the series, but it's, you know, nothing personal. And, um, and, but they were all a little bit scared of me, also because I came from the world of the theater, which is always a bit kind of pretentious and poncy and, you know, and, and, uh, and so they always thought I was, you know, taking things very seriously as I would 
be sitting in a little chair, my chair with my junk. And looking at my script cooking, there she is swatting away. She's such a swat. You know, swat, does that mean anything? You know, studying your lines. And then she came over to me and realized I was watching, I was playing Candy Crush. And um, <laughs> that was actually part of the process because often the character was doing really terrible things or having terrible things done to them in a terrible world. And there was something kind of just zoning and centering about something like that. Um, I gave up, I moved, I, I, I gave up on the Candy Crush. <laughs> moved on to Boggle, and, uh, <laughs> but probably music was a big part of that, was having, you know, and sometimes putting, you know, putting some earbuds in and just listening to music and concentrating on the job at hand. Yeah. How, what was the choreography for that? Was that, you know, in terms of how did they rig it, rig you, were um, you even in it, did they swap you out? No, never swapped out, and um, <laughs> that's just the way that has to happen, and also, I mean, I, I have gone on record to say in the past that it was one of the most extraordinary, actually, Kylie, to answer your question about the favorite scenes, that was actually one of them, because it was a time, I mean, I, I always had such extraordinary admiration for the crews and the extras, or, what do they, what, what do they call them now, background artists? Background, right, background, background actors. Background actors. Um, uh, on that series, some of who had been there from the absolute get-go and were there to the bitter end of those all hundred episodes of Wentworth. Uh, and all of the fellow cast members because that was a really, really high intensive day and a half of shooting. And uh, everybody's at the top of their game and just that, knowing that you could just absolutely rely on everybody to give their absolute best and focus. It was incredibly moving. I had been kind of coached up by our fight coordinator Zev. Zev whose last name I can never pronounce because it's a wonderful multi-syllabic um, Greek name. And I won't even attempt it. <laughs> Zev. Uh, and Zev had, um, I was highnessed up, and um, uh, there was discussion about sort of um, what the safety was, what the backups were. The, one of the hazards of, of being on a single pivot, uh, as any noose would be, is that it's got a lot of natural torsion in it, which means I was spinning a lot. So there was a, a couple of people that were nominated to, if I span, is that the right word? Spun. Uh, if I spun. Is that how you say it in America? <laughs> if I spun. <laughs> if I was spinning. That's just what we sound like. <laughs> if I was spinning too much, that somebody would step in and sort of stop or twist back or whatever, like while I was in the middle of the acting of it. Um, but the reality was, is that when you're in the middle of it, then, you know, maybe spinning is interesting. Uh, so they would start to get a little bit hesitant to get in there and stop me, and then I'd be the one in the middle of it, kind of going, you know, going... <laughs> <laughs> but then, at that point, I didn't know what was my best side. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, just, you just have to kind of go with it. But it was pretty... It was pretty full on, and we had to do it many, many times. But it was, um, it was, it was really emotional for all sorts of reasons. Not only what physically you were being put through, but as I said, this um, incredible focus where you suddenly feel, and it's uh, uh, having, you know, not many opportunities where I can sort of be amongst a group of two hundred people, or whatever, all doing their best in each of their individual ways. It was a, a very um, humbling and moving experience. Yeah. It's so nice to hear you. There's a line, I don't think any of them I could probably say to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's seen the show. Have you seen the whole show, Debbie? Yes. <laughs> Where's her mom? <laughs> Proudly wave your hands. <laughs> your dental expertise there, Pam. Yeah, I know, we've got a room full of shit parents, I can just tell you. <laughs> but you're, you know, you're raising children with impeccable taste. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Debbie, um, oh my favorite John, I bet. What? Oh. <laughs> um, Cover your ears, but not really. <laughs> I, well, a few people are wearing them on their t-shirts today. <laughs> How about this? We will say it with you. Yes. 
<laughs> I tell you, well, I have a couple, and I have to say that almost every time. I love this. We, we were only given the scripts. We'd be shooting sort of two episodes at a time. That's called a block. And we would shoot a block, and then halfway through that block, you'd, there'd be a, a, a mad scramble of a day when the scripts for the next block would be released. And, you know, people, if you had time, you'd be quickly having a look at it. But often, the, the first time you were actually getting a look at it was when you would sit around the table and have a read through about a one week out of shooting it. And there were always such a thrill, and I, and, but I would always wait with such excitement for when those scripts were out, see what line they'd given Joan Ferguson for this one. <laughs> Some of them, were the, they were the ones you, you least expected, or ones that, like I, don't, I wonder if somebody actually wrote the first time Joan said, huh. I think they actually wrote that she laughed at somebody, or derisively laughed or something like that. And I went, well, oh, how would Joan Ferguson laugh? Well, she would, she'd be too tight to actually just let a lot, you know. So it would just be a little bit of air. You know, <laughs> it. And out of that came this little, huh. And, and those were fun. Um, but they, um, I kind of loved you, licked your last, you know. And, um, <laughs> But the line that probably is my favorite, which is, you fucked the wrong minute. Yeah. 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 It wasn't in the script. When we it wasn't in the script? It wasn't in the script until, oh at the very last moment, in the writer's room, there was a writer, writer's attachment, Libby Cello, who's extraordinarily quiet, quite prim, and never would say very much, but she'd be there kind of collating material and, you know, doing copies of amendments and things like that. And she was the one who came yes. up. <laughs> it's always the quiet ones you have to watch out for. It's always the quiet ones you have to watch out for. But it's also, again, speaks to that point that you were making. Is that everybody was so kind of hooked into this, wanting to make it the best and make it better. And you could just see Olivia just been, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, that's the one. <laughs> Under any circumstance. And the human version of that was that there's an Akira Kurosawa film called Throne of Blood, which is about the story of Macbeth. And um, there's a couple of images in that, of the witches and, and Lady Macbeth in that, which are so chilling in their innocuous, gentle, scented stillness. So those were, those were big influences. Thank you so much. Great question. I really can't tell. I, we, you're, you're taught, you know, French in Canada from, you know, uh, all through your primary and secondary mm -hmm. school. Uh, and uh, the way they taught us in primary school was by watching a little show called Chez Alain. Oh. So you it? Yeah. Yeah. And that stupid little mouse. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, for the first time, you're, you're being introduced to French by somebody who goes, Bonjour, Susie! <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, when I graduated, I, I, it took me a long time to lower my voice just to ask for coffee. And <laughs> so, pay drop and keep going. Kiana, do you have kids? Do you need tissues? What are the top three things I like about myself? Yeah, personality wise. Everything. That's too, that's a little, too, I find that really difficult to answer. Um, I, I would. It's their therapy. Uh, even the things that I think I like about myself, I don't, actually. You know what I mean? That I, that I would, I'm trying to think honestly to answer that question, is that one of the things I pride myself in is never being satisfied, never, you know, always questioning, always being full of doubt. And of course, the moment I say that, I think, what a shitty characteristic to have. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, but it is. I it's really that's, that's my, my boyfriend over here. Um, <laughs> see, for ages. You don't know, call. What happened? <laughs> I, you know what? To make it easier, what's one thing that your castmates all said that they loved about you? Oh, I, oh, I wouldn't even know because I don't listen because I got the earpods in and I'm not listening. <laughs> listening to personal music. How do you get as she's doing? I, sorry, like, how do you get through the doubt? You're a perfectionist and. You really struggle to like, you know, accept maybe like the, the final. Yeah, I, 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 I would yeah. think that the idea of not never being mm -hmm. thinking you're finished, that, like never being stop, stopping questioning, never, you know, it can always 
and it will always be better. And it's usually better six months after you've finished it and you go, oh, that was the wrong thing. You know, that, that, that it's, it's never, never, never sort of sitting still with your curiosity and your questioning and your desire to do the best you can. Um, which is also, as I say, a really kind of corrosive and crippling thing as well. <laughs> so I haven't learned how to kind of keep the balance with it. And you have to, you know, bring it over here, bring it over here. So, so while she's bringing it I get next to you. I love it.